Kane, the man of blood. Though his skin is white, his heart is black. Every employee of the state, in government or in the services, of German birth or parentage, should be forced to resign. The innocent must suffer with the guilty. In every country at war, hatred like this seemed natural, even reasonable. The enemy was portrayed as an ogre of horrifying monstrosity, or as a discomfited clown. Dark neuroses lurked beneath the surface of civilian patriotism. Yet the patriotism was real enough. It inflamed the hearts of women as well as men. Some of its manifestations were unpleasantly hysterical. There were women who felt it their duty to force men into the services by every device of scorn and blackmail. I went to the music hall in civilian clothes on one leave, and uh, glass lined up outside. A lady come along, and up 35, and put a white feather into my hand. I looked at it, felt very disgusted, and there wasn't much I could do about it. As well as being given white feathers, there was another method of approach. You would see a girl coming towards you with a delightful smile all over her face, and you'd think to yourself, my word, this is somebody who knows me. When she got to about five or six paces from you, she would suddenly freeze up and walk past you with a look of utter contempt and scorn. If she could have spat, she would have spat. She just did not do that. And that was far more hurtful than a white feather because it made you curl up completely and there was no reply because she walked on. Thousands of other women found their patriotic outlet in Lloyd George's munitions program. These girls uh, were drawn from domestic service, mills, and shops mostly. A lot of very young girls there, and young married women, who had come principally to help keep their homes together when their husbands were away, and also many of them felt that they were helping the war effort very much. In Britain, more and more women took over from men as this industrial revolution gathered speed. By the end of 1915, there were 73 national munitions factories, as well as the armaments firms and all the privately owned industries converted to war work. American machines and British improvisation were the tools with which Lloyd George achieved success. The skilled craftsmen gave way to the machine minder, Victorian methods gave way to mass production. In the closing months of 1915, the national factory's combined output was 200,000 shells, nearly all of the lighter natures. In the following year, 1916, their total output was nearly 7 million, more than half of which was medium and heavy shell. Not only in munitions did women take over more and more jobs that had always been traditionally a man's. They repaired gas holders. They shoveled coal into the retorts that made the gas. Heavy work, hot and dirty. She's a lassie from Lancashire, just a lassie from Lancashire. She's a lassie I love so dear. The first women conductors appeared on buses and trams. Middle class girls too left their sheltered life in the home and went to work as clerks in offices or became nurses. For women the war marked a social revolution. Then the skies will see more blue Down in lava's lane, my dearie Wedding bells will ring It was terribly hard, terribly monotonous, but we had a purpose and we meant to do that work and we did. There wasn't a drone in the factory, and every girl worked and worked and worked. I didn't hear one grumble, 
and I hardly ever heard or knew of one that stayed out because she had her man in mind and we all had. I myself was working with sailors' wives from the three ships that sank, Abuka, Cressy, Hogue, and it was pitiful to see them. If anyone had a letter from France, we just read it and we got to know all, all the, the, the girls, uh, sweethearts or, or husbands, we got to know all their Christian names. And we were, when we used to go into the factory in the morning, how's Tommy, how's Dick, how's so have you heard from him? And of course some would shed a tear and say they hadn't, which meant what, you know, what had happened to them. Wages were good and some of the public resented this. They thought the girls in munitions were getting above themselves, for getting their place. We as munition workers were heartily disliked by the general public. You would go down the street and people would look at you and say, huh, one of those munition workers. Anything derogatory that could be said about you was said about you. It was very uncomfortable sometimes. And um, I think, as a general rule, the idea was that you made such enormous amounts of money and other people didn't. The most dangerous work of all was filling the shelves with explosive or making the explosive itself. The clothing we wore was fireproof, the shoes was fireproof and every time we went out to a meal we had to take all our, out, our fireproof clothing off and put on our outdoor clothing which took time from our dinner hour and again, we were searched when we returned in case of um, cigarettes, matches, or pins, etc. Once or twice we heard, oh, so-and-so's gone. Perhaps she'd made a mistake and her eye was out. But there wasn't any big explosion all the time I was there. We sang. We made the little pellets, very innocent-looking little pellets. But had there been the slightest grit in those pellets, goodbye. We got home and we had a lovely good wash. And, believe me, the water was blood red and our skin from then on was perfectly yellow. Right down through the body, legs and toes and toenails even, perfectly yellow. These women were called canaries. Their devotion was essential to the success of Lloyd George's armaments program. Through no fault of their own, they were also the cause of one of Lloyd George's toughest problems in 1915. The men, the trade unions, saw them as a threat. A threat to privileges built up painfully over decades and jealously guarded. Unskilled women, working machines, were a threat to traditional craft skills and methods. They were a threat to the future livelihood of men bargaining with employers employers who could make huge profits out of the war. The trade unions fought hard against the introduction of unskilled workers. Dilution, it was called. Resolved, but we refuse to entertain the proposal to allow the introduction of semi-skilled workers on work now done by fully qualified mechanics. Resolved, that no woman shall be put to work a lathe and if this is done, the men will know how to protect their rights. Each month of 1915, the number of strikes rose, from 47 in February to 63 in May. The disputes over dilution took place against a history of a hundred years of bitter industrial struggle. For the first time, the trade unions no longer represented the underdog. Now there was full employment. The workers were essential to the national effort. For the first time, cabinet ministers sat down to negotiate as equals with trade unionists. It was yet another revolution. It took a firm government promise that pre-war methods would be restored at the peace, together with an act of parliament controlling the whole field of arms production, including the booming profits, before the trade unions accepted dilution. To Lloyd George, drink was another enemy insidiously undermining his campaign for higher production. Beer could be bought in public houses which stayed open all day. Was this not a peril to efficiency? Was it not a cause of absenteeism? A new war regulation limited opening hours, 
And so the British pattern of life was changed in yet another way by the need for shells and guns. A slow business, a hard task, to uproot the habits of a nation steeped in tradition, over-affectionate towards old customs. Yet the king himself, symbol of one of Britain's most revered traditions, helped the change forward. He toured the industrial areas without fuss or pomp to persuade the workers that they too were performing national service. Without an adequate supply of shells, we cannot hope to win, he told them. As an example of self-denial, he signed the pledge and alcohol vanished from the royal household. He visited the wounded in hospital and the homes of their families. The king spared no effort to bind the monarchy and people together by shared experience. But the impatient war was clamorous with needs, and soldiers paid with their lives when design or manufacture faltered. The money was raised by five shillings a week for everybody, and then they introduced a bonus system. You filled so many shells, and after that amount had been filled, you got a bonus for how many more you filled. This was a very bad thing, really because it led to carelessness. People were not careful. The shells would come back to us as either too heavy or too light. And, and that was, of course, a very bad thing because they might fall short when they were fired. At present, our high explosive for 18 pounders is so unreliable that we cannot use it in large quantities. We have lost 36 guns in a month by premature explosions. This represents the highest percentage of bursts ever suffered by any artillery on both sides in this war. Even by the end of the year, most of the shells issued to the troops were the result of orders placed under the war office system which Lloyd George had so attacked. A third of them came from American and Canadian factories. Not until 1916 could Lloyd George's colossal program produce war material in overflowing abundance. Nevertheless, the British were rousing themselves, flexing their dormant muscles. Civilians and soldiers, industrial as well as military might, the Allies were moving into total war. The fight against food shortages fell upon a nation short of fertilizers, animal feeding stuffs, and above all, labor. In 1917, the Women's Farm Labor Force, over 230,000 of them by 1918, put on their uniforms. And the fight for higher food production was carried into the fields by a new army, the Women's Land Army. The Lilac Sunbonnet Brigade, as they were called, overcame the skepticism with which they were greeted by the farmers and formed a vital replacement to farm workers drafted by the inexorable demands of war to the front. Timber a vital commodity in a war which demanded more and more for pit props, for ammunition boxes, for huts and billets, for duck boards, for trench works, and for buildings. Called for more and more labor. Again, women came to help and invaded a man's world with energy and with unexpected skill. Nations came to accept the breaking down of traditions and firm beliefs, intrusions upon old ways, personal liberties. The war was insatiable. The men had marched away in millions and they had died in millions. Now women had to don service uniform. Today we had a unique war pageant of a most inspiring kind. A procession of 3,000 young women, representative of all the branches of war work in which female labor and ability is employed. Each section distinguished by its own separate uniform. 
The Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, the WACs, serve as cooks, typists, telephonists, transport drivers, motorcyclists. Some work in the censor's office, decoding messages in every modern language. The Women's Royal Naval Service, the Wrens, are employed on cleaning torpedoes, signaling, making mine nets, gas masks, depth charges and sails. The Women's Royal Air Force, known as the RAFs, are drivers and fitters on aircraft and airships. Women gained an importance as part of the machinery of victory that they had never enjoyed in their own right. Total war, rather than Mrs. Pankhurst and her suffragettes, gave women the right to vote. The Representation of the People Act of 1918 went even further. Women could now stand for election to Parliament. Everywhere, the most ancient of privileges and prejudices were swept away by the ruthless insistence of the struggle for victory. The needs of war, so simple in 1914, so demanding by 1918, had been met by the scientist and the engineer.